full disclosure, I actually filmed this once yesterday. Didn't like the way it turned out, so now I'm back to filming it again. I don't know how to get rid of this weird glare, but yeah, that's what we're going to go with today. Welcome back. My name is Anna, and this is what Anna read next. I filmed yesterday just a little reading wrap up and I just really didn't have the energy. I had some allergies and I wasn't really talking clearly. I find that sometimes when I film on a Sunday after I've sort of been alone all day, I don't always speak the most clearly. And then if I film after a day of work, I am sort of warmed up and I speak a little better and I have more to talk about. So this is a little chatty. There's also a mini book haul here um, and just some updates. Starting with what I read last month in April, I only read three books, so that's why I feel like I can squeeze more in here. The first book I read was The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. So this is a book, I kind of didn't know what to read next, but I wanted to do something that's sort of been on my TBR for a while, and I had the audiobook saved in my library audiobook app. I have a bunch saved that I just kind of want to read at some point, that way when I finish one I sort of have a list to reference. And I think I just picked it sort of to see. Unfortunately, I didn't realize until I was about halfway, two thirds of the way through that I had chosen the abridged version. So I listened to the abridged version of The Picture of Dorian Gray. So I didn't listen to the full version um, and I wasn't about to start over again. <laughs> I just wasn't gonna do it. This is peppermint tea, this is so good. And funny enough, I actually read, um, I didn't read, I added Happy Go Lucky by David Sedaris to my TBR. Uh, a few days ago because I watched a video from Modern Agema of some of her favorite books or books she read. I don't remember what I watched. I went on a whole Modern Agema binge um, and that book was on there. She had a good review of it. The excerpt seemed great. So I'm using my happy-go-lucky mug while talking about books. <laughs> Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Some really funny one-liners. Fred Henry is like the ultimate shit starter. Like he is the drama king of all time and he's so entertaining he's also really <laughs> he is like a such a bad friend like he's that friend when you tell kids you go or you're going into middle school like resist negative peer pressure lord henry is a hundred percent negative peer pressure he kind of reminds me of jerry in jerry seinfeld's show seinfeld jerry seinfeld's character himself of how he sort of manipulates his friends for his own entertainment that that's like the vibe i got from lord henry but uh, Victorian England, or is it Edwardian England? No, I think it's Victorian England because Oscar Wilde lived during Queen Victoria's reign and a lot of his references went over her head. That's right. Lord Henry was, he has some really funny one-liners. So he still left some of them in the book. I'm sure I didn't get all of them. One of my favorites was, um, or he was late according to principal. That principle was that punctuality is the thief of time. And a lot of funny little Oscar Wildisms in there, as my coworker calls them. She calls them Wildisms. So that was really enjoyable. Uh, great plot and parables for vanity. And I think it holds up more than ever now, especially as we become increasingly vain, increasingly self-centered. I mean, the picture of Dorian Gray, the idea is that Dorian Gray, the subject of this painting, sort of makes a deal with the devil, I guess with the devil, that as long as he never ages himself, that he, um, he'll he never age himself, he'll do whatever he has to. But in turn, the painting ages and the painting reflects more and more the horror of his character and who he becomes. He becomes this horrible, repugnant person who just has no morals, no conscience whatsoever. He stays young and beautiful forever. He continues just living his life and being horrible and selfish, but the painting decays. And I think that's a great parable for modern like Instagram and influencers and how you can be so ugly on the inside and your outside will preserve. Although I guess the images are going to always stay one way, but it doesn't hide the impurities of your soul. Drawing Gray, worth a read. I don't think I would go back and do the unabridged version just because I did read the abridged version by accident. So some time has passed. I took a phone call and I kind of debated starting the video over again, but I'm just going to keep going. So we talked about the picture of Dorian Gray. The next book that I read in April, I listened to an audiobook as well. It was Never Broken by Jewel. I believe the full title is Never Broken. Songs are only half the story. And this was an excellent book. I gave it five stars. 
I don't know what I expected. I maybe because I haven't always had the best luck with celebrity memoirs, I had lower expectations. But Jewel is such an incredible songwriter that I don't know why I didn't have higher standards going into this book. It was great. Her life story is fascinating. Um, she grew up in rural Alaska on a homestead with no running water in a very dysfunctional family. And she's had so many trials and tribulations through life um, and always been so adventurous. And, you know, knowing sort of some of the behind the scenes of her fame is really interesting. Jewel is a singer I listened to growing up. I heard her on the radio so many times. And she's one of those singers that with age, I've come to like even more. Hello, Bradley. We had good snuggles earlier, but we're in a snuggle mood as per usual. One of the interesting tidbits that stood out to me is that her song Intuition, which is very, very famous. You've probably heard it a million times on the radio if you were growing up in the early 2000s, 90s. Um, she had the song and she had said that she had a contract with Schick, the razor company, to write a song for their Intuition razor. And it had to sound like a real song that wasn't contracted for a product. It had to sound like this is a hit song and then the product happened to find it later and use it, not the other way around, which when in reality, she was contracted and paid a lot of money to write the song for the product and she succeeded. I would have never known that she wrote that song for a razor company. There are so many moments like that, moments where maybe she wasn't as radio popular, but other really incredible artists came up to her and gave her a lot of credit and told her to stick with her guns and stay true to herself and not to write for radio. Really great book. Highly recommend. The audiobook was available through my library, which I was surprised about. Um, they don't always have the widest selection, but I've been pretty pleased with what they do have. And I really recommend that because she reads it and it's just so wonderful to hear her. And if she has lyrics, she'll sing the lyrics and then she'll read them, which can get a little redundant, but I don't think it's bad. So I definitely recommend this book. Five stars. Loved it. Loved it. I found myself listening to it in the morning while I got ready for work, listening to it on my drives, different places. I went to pick up chairs on Facebook Marketplace, maybe 25 minutes away, listen to the book, listen to the book on the way back. Like every opportunity I had, I pretty much listened to this book. Excellent book. Favorite read of the month. Closely followed by that was the third book I finished in April, which is Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Berendt. This is a famous book. I know I had mentioned it before. I was really on a Savannah kick after Flannery O'Connor, and this book I pretty much read all month long. It was 386 pages, so it was long, and April was a tough month. April, a lot of life got in the way. I was working a lot, so I didn't have as much time to devote to reading. Um, so my two audiobooks I listened to alongside of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, and I really enjoyed this book. You have to keep in mind that it's nonfiction because it reads a lot like a novel. I, I looked up a lot of the things afterwards and it sounds like the author did take some liberties sort of with like the timing of events and some of the characters who were alive through the whole story actually, if you had looked at the actual chron chronology of events, had died partway through. So some people who had passed away early on but were still present as characters in there but basically, John Barrent is a writer from New York who goes to Savannah on a trip, and he sort of falls in love and falls in with the social scene there. It's very interesting. You have to keep in mind that this is not a PC book, and this is Savannah in the 1980s, and there's a lot of, not a lot of, but there's one character in particular who has a lot of casual racism. He's not an upstanding character. Like, he's not an upstanding guy. He sort of becomes friends with the author, I think the author's just so um, amused slash stunned by him because he sort of has like a string of things going on all the time and scams and schemes and somehow always manages to just dodge trouble. So that could be, that was off-putting. Overall, it's really interesting. There's a murder trial there and it's not a dark, heavy, sad murder trial, but that's when the witch doctor Minerva comes in who's based on, based on a real woman who has since passed away. And that's when the Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil comes in. If you love Southern Gothic, if you like a story with quirky personality characters, I mean, I read this and I was like, people are so boring nowadays. That was my main takeaway is we have no personality anymore. Everyone just goes to work and gets on their phone and no one socializes and we're all in our own bubbles and we're all wearing the same things and living the same lives and clocking in and clocking out. And this just really showed such a 
unique lifestyle. And it probably was unique for the time too, but that was what was so amazing. And I looked at this, I'm like, oh my God, we're all so boring. Where's the personality? Where's all the zest for life that these people had back then? And when did we lose it in these subsequent generations? So those are my three books that I read this month um, or last month in April rather. I did have some other books that I had started but hadn't quite finished during that month um, and I've since finished them. So I've already finished two in the month of May and it's only May 8th when I'm filming this and I'm pretty close to finishing another. I could probably finish it tonight. I'll probably finish it by the end of the week, my physical book. And then I am also listening to a book on audiobook with about three hours left. So I, I think May will be a bigger reading month for me. I also have Bear Bear by Tommy Orange right here from the library next. And I uh, put a few other books on hold for the library today, actually, but I know they'll probably take a little while to come in. I also have a mini book haul because I actually bought books, which is a rarity for me. So the backstory to buying these books is I've been in the process of trying to put together my apartment decor wise for a long time. This July will be two years that I've lived here. And I've just been so busy in the two years I've lived here. I've had one job the first year, another job this past year, and then I have the second job throughout pretty much the entire time. And then we had the cost of living crisis and I had other priorities. Now I have started to get some more pieces. I got those chairs for the kitchen that are great. They're like these really cool vintage chairs. Yesterday, actually on Facebook Marketplace on Sunday, I got a bookcase. Um, and it's one of those really cheap like cube bookcases. But here's the thing. Here's like one of my fatal flaws. I don't like to buy things made of particle board brand new. That like cheap fake wood plasticky stuff. I mean this is definitely particle board and I just had to do what I had to do. I went to Ikea. I did an Ikea haul and that was in December. But like going forward this year, I don't really like to buy particle board and pay full price for it because A, it's cheap and it's flimsy and it's just going to fall apart. And B, it's just bad for the environment. I don't want to create demand for this. And C, so much of it is already out there. Like you can always find these cube shelves on Facebook Marketplace. But the crazy thing is when I would go on Facebook Marketplace for the past few months, people would want like $75 for their little like basic cube shelf. And I'm like, I'm not going to pay that. Like that's crazy. Like I'm not going to pay an insane amount of money for a secondhand particle board shelf. And I also don't really want to pay the money for a solid wood one. I would be more willing to do that because it'll last me a long time. But I also drive a Civic, so I don't have like a ton of room to transport things. So I'd have to order it new or vintage and it'd be way marked up. So I've needed a bookshelf for a while and I've kind of like, I have like one that's kind of falling apart and it's tiny, but I wanted like a really decent one. I wouldn't say nice, it's not fancy. Found one, $25 Facebook Marketplace. I'm like, that is an appropriate price for a secondhand particle board bookshelf. Like that is appropriate. Drove up to Jupiter Farms, got it yesterday, no problem, gave him cash, brought it home, it fit right in the back seat. And so now I have some other things that I want for the home. I'm looking for a chair, I'm looking for a TV stand, also a TV eventually, um, but it, it's all coming together. I have some things I want to do with the art. Um, I'm sort of thinking about a headboard. Like I sort of have, I wouldn't quite say finishing touches, but I'm getting close to the finishing touches phase. Um, I would like a mirror to go behind me because this is my dresser that I film in front of. And I had one on Facebook Marketplace, but this woman and I were just a complete mess. Like probably five times one of us said we were going to get the mirror and then like ghosted each other. And like I did it as much as she did. Like we were a complete mess. It was really a cool mirror and I can't find one like it. But after a while I was just like, this is just not working. Uh, like we couldn't get our shit together, either of us. So the mirror, the dream of the mirror died. But anyway, I went to one thrift store. I went to the Habitat for Humanity Restore store in my area after work today. And I was sort of looking for a chair. I didn't really see anything I liked that much. I sort of looked around at some lamps and I didn't find anything. And so one of my students who I talked to almost every single day was talking about how she likes to go thrifting with her older sister. It's something they do a lot. It's one of her favorite things. So I asked her, where should I go thrifting if I need some furniture? And she told me to go to the American thrift store. I went to the American thrift store today and there was like no furniture, <laughs> like none whatsoever. But that's what I get for taking advice from a fourth grader. So I went in and I kind of looked around and like, it's sort of in an L shape. So the front part, I'm like, all right, like there's not really furniture, it's mostly clothes. 
There's like some art, there's some mirrors, like there's a few odds and ends. And I'm like, all right, well, let me just see what's like around this L. And it was men's clothing. But then I saw a bunch of books and not like a huge book section, but like decent enough. And I was like, well, clearly furniture's a bust. Let's see what they've got here. And I actually had a really good book haul and it was really affordable and I'm really excited about it and it's very random. So I got two novels in paperback because I don't really have books. So like I now I have a bookshelf, now I want books. I got The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. Never read any Ernest Hemingway. I feel like being in Florida and he lived, you know, so much in Key West and Cuba. Oh, I dropped Ernest Hemingway. Bradley, you're supposed to catch him. You're supposed to catch him. Great condition book. Very happy with it. I always flip through. I almost got a copy of The Kite Runner as well, but the person who had it before, like, wrote so much in it. It, it was to the point where I would have been disrupted reading it. It wasn't like a few things here or there. It wasn't like some highlight. It was like every margin was like filled with like gel pen annotations and I just couldn't do it. So unfortunately I had to, I had to leave the kite runner behind for my own sanity. I'll just read it another way. Um, sun also rises. We'll see if I like it. I know Hemingway is very polarizing. Some people like him, some people don't. So I have, you know, have this on my shelf now and that's on the TBR. Another one that I'm ashamed to have never read, especially because I did, I was a public health major and I was so into repro and everything is The Handmaid's Tale. I've never read The Handmaid's Tale and I've never watched the series. I told myself I wasn't gonna watch the series until I read the book. So I'm so glad to have a copy of it because I feel like I'm like the only person I know who has not read this book. And it's always been up my alley. It's always interested me. I don't know what's prevented me from reading it. I guess what's prevented me from reading everything else too. And weirdly, it's not on my 23 books for 2023. I don't know why. Um, so now I have a copy of it. So. Maybe when I go to New York in a few weeks for a wedding, I'll uh, bring this with me. I'm debating to bring Middlesex. Well, prior to owning this, I was thinking I'd bring Middlesex since it's a nice, big, thick book. But maybe I'll bring The Handmaid's Tale. I don't know. Maybe it's embarrassing to be in New York and be like the last person to have, have ever read The Handmaid's Tale. But I'm glad to have it. That's Margaret Atwood. This is a random book, super random. And I got it just because of how it looks. The Secret Taste of, I'm sorry, The Special Taste of Florida. This is a cookbook. I don't really want to read anything in this, but I think this is a beautiful coffee table book or just a book to display. The recipes look a little weird. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I saw something about dolphin something. Oh, Mayan pumpkin and corn bisque. That actually looks pretty good. Ooh. Okay, all right, I take it back maybe. Maybe I'll make something. Mine pumpkin and corn bisque, page 77, looks pretty good. Fresh shrimp and crayfish with angel hair pasta, yeah. There was something, something dolphin, I don't know. I mean, it's not bad, the writing is pretty nice. It's in really good condition. There are a few little spots up here, but I just really think this is a nice coffee table book. I feel like if you just had the spine stacked with some other things, it's almost like a more unique version of that Tom Ford book that everyone has on their coffee table. So this is my Tom Ford. And I love that it's unique. I love how pretty it is. I think when I find some other books to pair with it, it'll just be a really nice addition to my home, whether I actually use it functionally or just for decor. Then the last book I got, so random. I couldn't believe I found this in South Florida. My family don't watch this because this is going to be a gift for my dad. Okay, are we ready? It happened in the Catskills. So I am from the Catskills of New York. And this is like the most random thing. I saw this cup, this spine on with all the other books about everything in the world. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, you've got to be kidding. Like, how is this happening? So this is all about 1950s Catskills. And it's like firsthand accounts from... Oh gosh, memories of busboys, bellhops, guests and chefs, singers and dancers, comedians, proprietors, bookers and agents, waiters and musicians, memories of nearly a century of life at a singular place. So my understanding is that, and this is based on what I've been told by people from this area where I grew up and people who've researched it more, is that the Catskills were a very popular vacation spot for many people, but particularly for Jewish Americans uh, in the last hundred years and probably still to some extent. If you go upstate, you will see several Jewish enclaves of 
varying levels of um, devotion, I guess, of orthodoxy. Common to sort of be driving through rural New York upstate and see, um, you know, what you would expect from the rest of rural America and then to take a turn and see like an entirely orthodox or Hasidic area. I assume Hasidic. I'm not 100% sure, um, but like a very distinctly Jewish area. This was a popular area for people to vacation because A, they weren't really going to Europe because Europe wasn't very welcoming, particularly if you think about the 1940s, who was going to go to Europe if you're Jewish. And then the rest of the U.S. also wasn't very welcoming. So a lot of times people who were Jewish would go vacation in the Catskills. And if you've ever watched The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel when they go to the Catskills, it very much gives this vibe. So that was like a historical well-known thing. And my dad not only loves random trivia about New York, where we're all from, he also loves The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So I think this is going to be a great gift for him. He actually, he has so much random trivia about history, about like the Hudson River. Like, I feel like everyone who's from that area, it's like just such a dad thing. Like there's always random stuff about like what factory used to be there. And yeah, it's just like a thing. My parents actually moved to another state I was, I had the realization, I was like, oh my God, there's going to be a whole new state in a whole new region with a whole other set of useless trivia for you to regurgitate and tell us. And he sort of laughed, but I think this is like the perfect gift for him. His birthday's in June, so it's coming up. My sister and I usually go in on a, a Father's Day gift, but I think this would be a really nice gift for him. I am so happy to have found this. What a gem. I haven't even really flipped through it. But I think this is one of those books that you can kind of leave out, read a little bit of, then go back. Um, it looks like it's all about the social scene. Here's some of the inside of it. So there's like the social scene. And almost, it kind of seems like Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil vibes, but more, um, I don't know. I would say more place specific, but... I, that was such a Savannah book. I can't really tell. I guess there's less of a narrative. It's more just anecdotes and vignettes. But really cool. And everyone outside. So I thought this was so unique. I can't wait to give this to him. And here's the most amazing part. All of these four books. So it happened in the Catskills, Special Taste of Florida, these two beautiful hardcovers that are so random. And these two novels, all four, all together, tax included, $5.95 for all four. Amazing. I'm very happy with that. I, you beat that. $5.95 for all four books, two of which are hardcovers. So I'm definitely going to keep going back to that store. I kind of was looking through some of the books, and there were some like book of the month type books. There was a book by Britt Bennett, not The Vanishing Half, but another one. There were some others I was tempted to get, but I didn't want to go crazy. And I kind of feel like maybe there are other people in the area who have similar tastes and sort of like bring their books that they're done with and then maybe get new ones. And I feel like maybe we have like, could have a symbiosis after I clear out some of the books that I no longer want. So I'm excited to return to that bookstore, return, not bookstore, American thrift store that has books and see what else they have. Um, oh no, I want to say one more thing. I want to talk about the 23 books for 2023, and I also DNF two books in April that I forgot to mention. Our Missing Hearts by Celeste Ng. I almost said Our Little Fires Everywhere. I read Our Little Fires Everywhere. I really enjoyed it, um, but Our Missing Hearts was on my 23 books for 2023 list. I really wanted to read it. I got about 60 pages in. It did not hold my attention. My mom also said she DNF'd it, and I, my mom and I tend to have pretty similar tastes, so that kind of gave me some affirmation. I looked up the ending and then I looked up the plot and like, I, I don't feel bad. I don't feel like I really missed out. I think maybe Celeste Ng's strength is in those sort of like neighborhood, small town, uh, women and family stories, not so much dystopia. Also DNF'd a book called The Boardwalk Bookshop by Susan Mallory. I put it on audiobook and I listened to a chapter of it one morning. And I thought I wanted something really sort of like light and fun. And I just couldn't get into it. Like, it's too light for me. Like, at least at that time, I had a hard time at work. And I thought, I just want to listen to something mindless and like a beach read. And I've said before, I really don't like beach reads. 
And I guess that's true. So Night in the Garden of Good and Evil with all its partying and characters and, you know, excess and intrigue is more of a fun read, even though there's a murder tied into it and technically it's gothic, but it's not like heavy. It's not like dark. I'm trying to think of a book that's real dark. Maybe my, um, my radar for what's dark is different, but like The Bluest Eye is pretty dark, even though I love The Bluest Eye. It's one of my favorite books. Luster was dark by Raven Leilani. Like it's sort of like it's heavy. It weighs on you a little bit. I'm sure there are others that I can't think of at this moment. So I, I DNF both um, Our Missing Hearts and The Boardwalk Bookshop just because they didn't hold my interest. So now I'm at 22 books for 2023 because I took off um, that and I'm uh, reading my eighth book in that list. 14 more books in that list to read and get through. I was watching a video by Kieran Reader and she had said something like she doesn't really like to do the 23 books for 2023 because she feels very boxed in and I kind of get what she's saying. At first I didn't really think so. I sort of viewed it as a guide because I have about 135 books on my TBR right now. Maybe a little more, a little less by the time this goes up, but roughly 135. I feel like I'm more of a mood reader than I realize and I would sort of look at the 23 books for 2023 as a guide, but then like you do sort of feel boxy. You feel like you want to complete that list and feel accomplished. And even though my goal for this year is 40 and I'm on 18 that I finished in early May, I'm very much on track and I would read more than 23. It still kind of feels like, Oh, if I don't get to that book that's on my list for this year, it sort of feels like a shortcoming unless I, you know, DNF it because I really don't like it and it doesn't meet my expectations. But then there are other books that you might be more in the mood to read. Like I just requested on hold um, Choke by Chuck Palahniuk, which I had never heard of by the time I had made my list. And I wanted to read it. I was looking through my big, long TBR on Goodreads and I was thinking about what else I could request because I also requested You Are Having a Good Time by Amy Baradell because they both are in the system, but they actually transfer to my library because they're in other branches in the county. And I know it takes a little while, so I like to request them early. I still have to finish Ghost Music by Anya, which I could probably finish tonight, finish in a few days. And I'm really enjoying that one. And then I want to finish There, There by Tommy Orange. So by the time I'm sort of wrapping up or halfway through There, There, I'll probably have those books ready to go. And both those books, There, There and Ghost Music, are on my 23 books for 2023 along with you're having a good time. But then like, I still really want to read Choke because it looks really entertaining. And I shouldn't have to justify that. And I guess I really don't, but it is interesting how these lists sort of become constraints in a way. Like they're meant to be guides, but then in a way you do feel kind of boxed in. I don't know if anyone else relates to that, but that's sort of what I'm finding. And maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm taking it too seriously. Maybe because I you know, haven't read in so long. I just want to be really productive and read a lot and feel more well read. But um, I don't know, we'll see. I'm still enjoying what I'm reading and I'm not going to let it stress me out. This is meant to be fun. Um, but I'm curious to know what everyone thinks. What do you think of my random books that were less than $6? What do you think of what I read this past month and only reading three books? Did you have a month where you just couldn't read because life got in the way? Let me know. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.